Hello and welcome once again to Intro to Computer Games and Simulations here at Lorain County Community College. I am Mike Substelny, your instructor for this term. We're going to be talking today about formal elements of games. That means we're going to be once again in Game Design Workshop. We'll be in Chapter 3 in the first, second, or third edition of the book. Um, last time we said challenge was important and conflict was important, but challenge with risk is very engaging and more engaging to the player than just a challenge without any risk. And you're looking at some challenge and risk in Grand Theft Auto 4 right there. Um, challenge without risk, as we saw in uh, Lord of the Rings Fellowship, was less engaging for the player. Today we're going to talk about play theory, player interaction patterns, and game objectives. We have three large topics to cover, so let's get right into it. Johan Huizinga, a Dutch historian, wrote the book Homo Ludens, The Study of the Play Elements in Culture in 1938. Looked into um, what the subject we're talking about today. At the time, homo sapiens was a popular term, man the reasoner, and someone had come up with homo faber, man the maker. This was in the popular parlance, sounding very intellectual in 1938, and so he came up with homo ludens, man the player, attempting to popularize this as part of human nature. So when he published homo ludens in 1938, he considered it a history book, not a science book. He was a historian, not a scientist. And he explored the question, how far does culture itself bear the aspects of play? He said that human culture arises in the form of play, which is high stakes for game developers. We are, in many ways, the keepers of our culture. He described gameplay as a free and meaningful activity that was not real life. If it's real life, he didn't consider it playing. You carried out this free and meaningful activity for its own sake. You didn't get anything else out of it. Gameplay was also bound by its own rules. And as we learned in week two, games must have rules. Huizinga coined the term play theory and described the conceptual space in which play occurs. This is going to be an important term for us. Any game you've got is going to involve conceptual space. The conceptual space is in the mind of the player. For example, here in uh, Star Wars Battlefront 2, we've got this underground cave where this game is taking place and the players are running around virtually. In uh, Evil Clutches, we've got another underground cave where conceptually the game is taking place. In Zaya Legends of a Drift System, the game takes place in outer space and on a series of planets and asteroids and astronomical, astronomical phenomena. So the conceptual space on this game board is outer space. But this game of Zaya actually took place on my kitchen table. The actual space of gameplay may be quite different from the conceptual space. And he came up with the concept of the magic circle, shown in red on these diagrams. The magic circle doesn't, isn't really there, but it's what he said separated conceptual space from real space. Players will do things when they are inside that magic circle that they would never do outside the magic circle, like ambushing someone with guns in um, Red Dead Redemption, as we're seeing in this photo here, or carjacking somebody on the streets of a fictitious city, as we're seeing in Grand Theft Auto 4, or denying medical supplies to wounded naval officers in this... Uh, uh, interactive novel here, A Choice of Broadsides, by um, Choice of Games. Other entertainment, of course, offers violence, 
sex and other taboos that we can hear about. Movies, novelettes, films, novels, music even can be about violence and sex and other taboos. But only games, only games allow players to experience courage and actually make tough decisions. As in uh, what many decisions that need to be made in this situation in a game of Artemis where you're about to get blown to smithereens by a horde of alien spaceships. So entering the magic circle, Huizinga said, meant accepting the invitation to play. And as you develop games in your career, you're going to be creating an invitation to play in your games. Laser tag, for example, offers potential players a pretty exciting invitation to play with this plastic ray gun that looks cool. You could write a laser tag game that you played with your smartphone. It wouldn't look as cool as the laser tag gun, though. Um, a pinball machine often has lots of blinky lights and plays music and makes loud sounds and things like that as the invitation to play. And you can, oh, here's a pinball machine I used to have with its blinky lights, you can see, and exciting things going on. Makes you want to sit down and, or stand by it and play it. Uh, here's a game that you might see in the gamers lounge here on our campus, Chronic Chaos. It was made with a very exciting cabinet and artwork that offered a really neat invitation to play that was uh, intended to get you to want to enter the magic circle of this game. Um, we have this available if you want to use it for developing your games in this class. I've got this in my office. The X Arcade cabinet can allow you to replace the keyboard of a computer. This plugs into a USB port, and those buttons and that joystick can be programmed into your game instead of the keys of a keyboard. And that's a slightly better invitation to play. It's more fun than using keyboard keys for most players. So I offer that to you as a way to offer an invitation to play in your games, especially if you're going to create a game that would be played by the public. Um, here's an interesting invitation to play. This is a game that has no buttons at all. I'm wearing a Brainwave helmet to play the um, Play Attention series of games. And that brainwave helmet, everybody looks at that and says, oh man, that is the coolest thing I've ever seen. I want to control a game with my brainwaves. So even though the games themselves are very simplistic, just offering that neat invitation to play gets players to want to try these games. All right. Once inside the magic circle, the players may assume roles. They may not be themselves anymore. For example, when you're playing Monopoly, you assume the role of a real estate tycoon. When you play chess, you become a glorious military commander. When you play uh, Wii Boxing, you become an amateur prize fighter. When you play Sonic the Hedgehog, you become an impatient but very fast hedgehog. Okay, now we're on to the, play the way players interact with games. This is an illustration from Game Design Workshop by Tracy Fullerton. This is in every edition of the book. You will be expected to be able to discuss these terms of player interaction patterns. Let's go over all of these uh, patterns and describe what they mean. All right. Some games allow you to choose a player interaction pattern, such as single player versus game or multiple players versus game, these first two patterns. Some players lock you into only some games lock you into one player interaction pattern. Let's talk about single player versus game. You've created that when you created your game um, of, uh, drawing a blank here, this is Galactic Mail. A player versus player game, good example is chess. A team competition game, we've all seen these like basketball, team competition game. Baseball, team versus team in competition. Or in the video game world, how about that uh, Star Wars Battlefront 2 where you can have two teams take each other on um, virtually in various different environments? How about multiple individual players versus a game? Well, you can have a multiple individual players all playing Bejeweled Blitz and all trying to beat each other's scores, but they play separately from each other. Um, Farmville, that whole 
genre of games, all the players are playing by themselves, but they are all trying to show off their skills in front of each other. Um, so these ga type of games can be played asynchronously, and many, many Facebook games that are asynchronous use this player interaction pattern. And that's how they spread. How about multilateral competition? Poker would be an example of multilateral competition, where everybody's against everybody, all trying to win the hand with their betting, their bluffing, and their luck. So in multilateral competition, you have three or more players directly competing against each other, usually synchronously. And most gamers would define this as the classic multiplayer format, although there are many types of multiplayer games. In multilateral competition, it's popular with board games, um, the old family board games, even before there were home computers. Fullerton in the textbook suggests that three to six players is optimal. Once you get a huge number of players, it becomes an unwieldy game, and the interaction becomes a little less fun, especially if there's turn-taking involved. Question I ask you is, did we sports stumble upon this? This was not used a whole lot in um, games that you would play on the computer at home, but Wii Sports came up with ways to play as multilateral competition. And that game became very popular with home players. And in fact, people have parties uh, just to play Wii Sports to this day. And it's a popular family activity to this day. And I think since Wii Sports, other games have been developed that use this same player interaction pattern using computers. All right, let's talk about unilateral competition. How is that different? Well, a game of tag where one player is it and everybody else is not it would be unilateral competition. So it's not, the players do not have the same thing. There's a whole bunch of players that have one role and one player that has another role. Um, Halo 3 ODST. Uh, we're seeing an example of that. Any game with a tag or King of the Hill scenario, in Halo 3 you can play King of the Hill in that. And when you're the King of the Hill, you have a different role than when you're trying to knock down the King of the Hill. Cooperative play. Wingman Sam, a game you're going to make in this class, is a cooperative play game, often called co-op. Artemis Spaceship Bridge Simulator is another co-op game. Although these games are very different from each other. Let's explore why. Wingman Sam is a symmetrical multiplayer co-op game. Most computer games are like this. Um, if you were to play a Halo or a Star Wars Battlefront, for example, and you're in a co-op, you are playing basically the same sort of role. Um, in Wingman Sam, you both have a fighter plane. You can both shoot bullets. You both die under the same situation. And that's a symmetrical multiplayer co-op. Artemis is asymmetrical. All the players have different resources and abilities when they're cooperating with each other. For example, the chief engineer deploys the power and the coolant and sends the damage control parties to fix different systems on the ship. The um, science officer scans all the different things in the sector and determines where the enemies are and what's dangerous and what's not. The weapons officer, or uh, this is the helm officer we're looking at. The helm officer steers the ship left, right, up, down, activates the warp drive, activates the impulse drive, slows the ship, accelerates the ship, etc., etc. They all have to work together in order to uh, achieve victory. There's also um, other roles, the captain, the communications officer, and the weapons officer in that game. Now we get to the final section of today's lecture where we talk about game objectives. There are a whole lot of different objectives and keep these in mind as you mix up the recipes for your games in your career. Oh, that's a different list or different examples of possible objectives. How about the capture game where you're trying to attack, capture, or kill Enemy units in your game. Chess is a good example. Many computer games are capture or kill based games. Chase game, laser tag is a good example of a chase game where you're uh, pursuing 
your opponent. Race game is different from a chase game. Let's talk about why. In a race game, the first to reach the same finish line wins. Everybody is headed for the same objective, the same finish line, trying to get there first. Freeze tag, for example, has no finish line. Freeze tag is a chase game. And laser tag is kind of a technological version of freeze tag. You are chasing each other around, um, trying to pursue wherever the query goes, not necessarily toward a finish line. Let's talk about alignment games, where you're trying to get pieces or units in some certain alignment. Any of the bejeweled games uh, are an alignment game. You're trying to line up pieces to achieve an outcome. Um, here is Ion Field, a game that was developed for Lorain County Community College online chemistry courses to teach the octet rule. It's basically a bejeweled sort of game where you're trying to line up um, ions to form uh, molecules. You get these atoms to combine with each other using the octet rule, and you play this game for a long time, you get pretty good at understanding the octet rule. Tetris, of course, is a classic alignment game everybody has probably played, where you're trying to fill in gaps with different shaped pieces. Next game objective we'll talk about is the rescue game. It is rescue or escape. Um, Donkey Kong would be an example of a rescue objective. You're trying to overcome all these obstacles in order to rescue someone. Um, Portal would be an example of an escape game where you're trying to escape uh, from all these nefarious traps. Um, protect is also a version of this, according to your textbook. What would be an example of a protect game? Well, I could think of one from back in the day in the 1980s. We had this missile command game where you had cities that needed to be protected. They were constantly uh, being uh, bombarded by nuclear weapons, and your job was to shoot down as many as you could for as long as you could and protect your assets. Let's talk about the Forbidden Act game. And yeah, believe it or not, this ridiculous cover of the game of Twister has not changed very much over the years. Um, a Forbidden Act game is where you lose if you do something you're not supposed to do. A Simon Says game would be Forbidden Act, like Twister. Um, another great example is operation. Everybody's probably seen. You have to do certain things, just don't touch the metal sides of the board with your tweezers. Here I am playing a gigantic life-size operation at uh, a World Science Fiction Convention a couple of years ago. Construction games. Very popular game genre. Here we have a construction game. Uh, uh, oh, this is a city bill. This is... Um, Sim City from back in the DOS days of the 1980s. Oh, I love that game. Um, usually in a construction game that is pure construction, a player defines, defines success. This is the closest thing to a toy. If all you have is the objective of construction, you have a game that is pretty much like a model railroad set where you're just building things. Um, it's less game-like than most games until you start adding other objectives. But if it is purely a construction game, the player will define their own objectives for success. Even in um, SimCity, you could have Godzilla trounce your city if you wanted to. Farmville, another example where the player defines their own success. You can just build and build and build. You can sort of be competing against your friends. But there's no end to the building you can do in that game. Railroad Empire, another Facebook game that comes uh, out of Cleveland here. Um, you're building an empire and showing off your nationwide railroad to your friends who are also building their railroad empires. And, of course, the classic construction game of all construction games, Minecraft, which can be played in many different ways, but all of them involve construction. And this has been an amazing hit for an indie game. 
How about exploration games? Here we have an old exploration game I like to play, VGA Planets. It was a DOS game back in the day. Exploration is often combined with other objectives. In exploration games, you'll often find yourself fighting, for example, and doing other things. But it is possible to have a game that is nothing but exploration. I don't have an example of it here, but I think Endless Ocean for the Wii is an example of a purely exploration game. Oh, and Dwarf Fortress is a good exploration game that has exploration combined with other objectives, like building and fighting. How about solution games? Solution games are actually puzzles or series of puzzles. For example, Portal is a series of puzzles where you have to learn to understand the complex rules of the Portal universe and solve your way out of being trapped. You can have a multiplayer solution game like Wheel of Fortune where you're all trying to solve the same puzzle and you're competing with each other to win that puzzle. How about Outwit Games? Song Pop is a good example of an Outwit game. You can play that one on Facebook where you're competing against each other to answer questions. So, you have all these game objectives that we've just gone over that you can mix and match and combine as you build your games. And I'll point out, as I have already, many games offer several of these objectives all at the same time. Uh, for example, um, StarCraft, where you must construct additional pylons, um, is uh, capture, kill, construction, and exploration all at the same time. And sometimes during different scenarios, you may have chase, rescue, or escape going on in a StarCraft uh, scenario. Many um, of the uh, campaign adventure games, here we have a, a game in the um, Uncharted series. I think this is Uncharted 2 where uh, you have capture, kill, chase, rescue, escape, exploration in series. You may not do all of them at the same time, but you will spend some time trying to capture and kill, sometimes chasing or being chased, sometimes rescuing and escaping, sometimes exploring, and you could build a novel length adventure by combining different uh, objectives in series on top of each other. Now, let's talk about story objectives versus non-story objectives in terms of these two games. We have Lord of the Rings, Fellowship of the Ring, which was, uh, had a lot of resources put into it. And then we've got Lego Star Wars The Complete Saga, which is less complete than it used to be now that we have a uh, new film. If we compare these two games, there's a non-story objective inserted into Lego Star Wars, or a bunch of them, that made it so much more fun. Fellowship could have benefited from something like this. Let's have a look at it. By adding a little objectives, the game mechanics can be improved so much, especially when you're trying to get through a story. Here we have a little bit of video of Luke Skywalker and Obi-Wan Kenobi on Tatooine going through a scene that was in the game and in the movie, but they get to do something the characters in the movie didn't get to do. As they're running around, you'll notice targets spawn little hearts that help boost your health and little Lego blocks that can be later used to build things. There were no little hearts popping out in the film. There were no little Lego blocks coming out, but it gives you something to run around and collect. It adds a little bit extra to the adventure. Had there been some little Lego blocks to collect in uh, Lord of the Rings Fellowship of the Ring, that would have been a much more fun and engaging game. Just that little game mechanic. Okay, that's it for this week. Next time we are going to introduce dramatic elements of games to you using some of the games we've talked about today. Until next time. This is Mike Substelny signing off for Intro to Computer Games and Simulations here at Lorain County Community College.